morning, everyone, and welcome back to the 2016 Open Simulator Community Conference. I want to remind you all, in world and our web audience, you can view the full conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. And tweet your questions or comments to at OpenSimCC with the hashtag, hashtag OSCC16. We had a great day of presentations yesterday, and if you missed them, never fear, we'll be posting them on our site and all of today's presentations as well in the near future. So definitely look for that. This hour, we are happy to introduce the session called Virtual Robotics, Creating, Collaborating, and Constructionist Learning in a Virtual World. Our speakers are Karina Gervin and John Lester. Dr. Gervin is an academic in at Cardiff University and co-editor of the British Journal of Educational Technology. Interested in new technology, she has been actively researching the use of virtual worlds and robotics. In this project, she brings these interests together as part of a European Commission funded project on educational robotics for STEM. And John, Pathfinder, as many know him in the virtual world, Lester, is currently a product manager at OpenText and has been a pioneer of developing educational communities for Linden Labs, Open Simulator, and Unity platforms. John also sits on the board of virtual ability as a champion for accessibility. Welcome to you both, and I will pass the mic to Dr. Gervin. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, my name's Karina Govan. Thank you for the introduction. Um, <clears throat> and yes, uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, virtual robotics, creating, collaborating, and constructionist learning in a virtual world. Um, in World um, and the Second Life, I'm known as Sleepy Little Thing. And I'm really lucky to have uh, met John, um, who has uh, worked as a consultant with me on this project. And hopefully what we're going to talk to you about today, you'll find really interesting. It'll be a little bit different maybe for some of you. Um, and it's a lot of fun for us. So I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, so <clears throat> just to give you a back, uh, an overview to the, the talk, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, background to the virtual robotics project that I'm involved in, just to set the scene. And then myself and John will talk a little bit about why um, we're using OpenSim for this project and um, the design of the environment. Um, I'm then going to talk to you a little bit more about Slurtles and we'll have a demonstration of them in action. Um, and then I'll talk just very briefly about what the next steps are for the project and then we'll open up to Q&A. So, um, to uh, just to tell you a little bit about the um, robotics project that's uh, funded by the European Commission, it's called ER for STEM or Educational Robotics for STEM, and it's a collaboration between seven uh, institutions in Europe. It's led by the Technical University of Vienna, um, and then we have a pedagogic partner, the University of Athens. And myself at Cardiff University, I'm involved in the, the pedagogy, doing the virtual world angle, and I'm also evaluating the whole project. And then we have the Practical Robotics Institute of Austria, uh, Certicon Across Limits, and the European Software Institute, who are all the commercial partners on the project. <clears throat> and the uh, project aims to do a number of things. Uh, the first is that in educational robotics, we see a lot of educational robotics projects, uh, research being done generally by people in computer science um, or engineering domains, um, but they don't have the, the pedagogic background that a number of us have. And so the focus of the project is to design and implement a framework of best practice, looking at what's already being done, but also what's being done by our partners. Um, this comprises of creating an educational robotics activity template. So something that's a bit broader than a, than a simple lesson plan, um, but not so vague as something like a scheme of work that might last maybe over a month or two months. Um, and really thinking about what are the components of educational robotics that are different to a, a normal lesson. Um, we're creating a repository of resources for teachers, and we're running workshops with just over 4,000 students across Europe. And this comes under an imperative from the European Commission that we need to in increase um, 
students with 21st century skills, um, increased engagement in STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we want to get more women in STEM. And these are imperatives both in education, um, and I'm talking right the way through from primary all the way to the end of secondary or K to 12 education, and also getting more women in STEM careers. So this is kind of the frame, the background for the project. But robotics in education really isn't that new. Um, it's been going since you know, kind of the 70s, really, um, you know, with the work of uh, people like Seymour Papert, uh, built very early robots, which were programmed by, by students. Um, so we already know quite a lot of stuff. And we actually already know that um, educational robotics activities are likely to increase um, STEM knowledge, interest, attitude, and motivation across both genders, but actually particularly for girls, which is really interesting. Um, and there's a, a number of possible reasons why, but generally speaking, the research doesn't go into it very much. Um, so that's one of the things that we're looking at with the evaluation that I'm running. And what we see is that robotics, uh, um, educational robotics activities are a great way to develop 21st century skills. Again, not really revolutionary, um, um, knowledge this. Um, I think some of this is, is possibly quite obvious. But with this project, what we're trying to do is actually unpick what's going on um, during these robotics activities, where you have uh, single gender groups, so all boys, all girls, mixed gender groups, so we've got some boys and some girls. Um, and what's quite interesting, what we're seeing so far, I've got lots and lots of video data from all around Europe that I'm going through at the moment. And what we see is when we've got say, for example, two boys and two girls, we seem to tend to get fairly good collaboration and teamwork going on. Where there's a gender imbalance, so there's only one girl in the group or only one boy in the group, those children tend to stay quite quiet. They follow along with what everybody else does. And maybe that's actually quite good collaboration, but it's interesting that that happens. Going back to our um, equal gender groups, what we also see is that our groups tend to pair off. So we've got two boys, the boys work together, two girls, the girls work together. And actually we tend to get cooperation between those two groups rather than collaboration. And communication tends to break down. Again, this is really interesting. If we're going to get more and more young people into STEM subjects, things like collaboration, teamwork, communication are really, really important. So how can we ensure that these young people are developing these skills in a useful way that they can apply to pe with people um, of different genders. So we're looking at, like I say, collaboration, teamwork, uh, communication, critical thinking, and along with that reflection as well, reflection on learning, uh, computational thinking, and of course, more broadly, problem solving, and of course, creativity leading to uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. So we're looking at a lot in this project, basically. <laughs> um, but specifically thinking about the virtual world element, everybody else on this project, all the other partners are all running robotics workshops in their countries. Um, and they're all with physical robots. And because of some of my past research, I was really interested in actually, what would be the difference if we used virtual robots in a virtual world? Would we be able to use them to support similar outcomes? Would there be new opportunities? and what would be the limitations. And in this, I'm thinking about both the pedagogical, so the teaching and the learning, the technical, and the outcomes for the learners, not just in terms of what they learn, but also in terms of their experience, because we need them to, to enjoy this stuff and want to participate. So why would anybody interested, why would anybody be interested in doing virtual educational robots? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, first of all, the cost. Um, things like Lego Mindstorms um, or even um, Raspberry Pi kits um, do cost quite a bit of money just to purchase, particularly a class set if you've got 30 children and you want to have one between two. You've got to buy 15 of them. Um, and all of these kits need to be maintained. Also, parts go missing, bits go missing. Um, and this becomes less of an issue, potentially, in the virtual world. Um, they can collaborate at distance, so we can get children in different schools to collaborate on a project together. They can develop digital literacy and competency. Of course, we can have multiple users, and it supports 
in situ engagement. Now, this is not the first time that I've done this. Um, I've had a little bit of a, a proof of uh, concept um, activity back in Second Life. And there's a little picture of, of the Slurtles when they were first created. And the first project was actually looking at constructionism as a pedagogy in the virtual world. Um, and constructionism, for those who aren't familiar with this, is the idea that by exploring, testing, and extending un our understanding through the construction of shareable, or personally meaningful artifacts, we can really develop and enhance our, our learning. Um, and this was implemented with adults with very little experience of programming in Second Life and using Slurtles, Scratch for Second Life. Um, but for this particular project, um, the one I'm working on now, uh, we, I wanted to move into OpenSim. Why? Because it's a project with seven to 18 year olds. Uh, schools want control in terms of privacy and protection. They need reliability. They need a reliable system. OpenSim has been uh, really, it's really come on leaps and bounds since the stuff that I first did in Second Life. Um, it's low cost. We can also have a focus on the task, on the robotics tasks we're asking learners to engage in, rather than them having to go off and, and find resources, for example. Um, and it's a very flexible environment in terms of the design. Um, so at this point, I'd like to pass over to Pathfinder. Cool. Thanks a lot, Karina. I'm going to go through, through these slides really quick and just give you my perspective as the consultant and you know the the, uh, the uh, contractor or developer on on creating setting up these spaces uh, for Karina in OpenSim. And the quick the three questions I want to go through is really you know talk about why OpenSim was a great technology match for the project. Um, how did the age appropriate design influence the content and configuration of the grid? And and in particular, how did the hypergrid enabled content enrich the build? So the, the first question, why was OpenSim a, a great match for the technology? And there's really nothing um, else out there in terms of an in situ and atomistic content creation platform. By in situ, I mean people creating at the same time in real time in an environment that's live. And atomistic, meaning the tools are there to build things from you know very, very small components. You're not, you're not just given like, here's a chair. It's like, oh, we have to build a chair out of prims. Um, Multi-user multi interactions, full control over the grid, the privacy and content backup was a real big issue. Um, and also, we have the option now, obviously, for running a local grid off a USB drive with OpenSim, uh, in particular with, with Ferd Frederick's um, Dreamworld, uh, uh, Dreamworld software that allows you to run or set up your own grid locally so that um, the project could be instantiated in schools that maybe don't have access to, the, uh, to servers on the internet. And in particular, in terms of content creation, OpenSim has come leaps and bounds in terms of the availability for content, um, in addition to a professional community. Uh, the, the way the grid was set up is that no one else can teleport into the grid from other grids, but administrators who have logged into the grid can leave. So they're able to free range, the administrator are able to free range like Karina and myself and any additional teachers in the future can explore the rest of the grid. So that opens up a great big potential for growing the community which is critical because in academia, it's all about uh, colleagues. It's all about getting connections to other people. Oops. Uh, how did the age appropriate design influence both the content and the configuration of the Slurtle grid? I just wanted to back up here because I love this, this image here. That's the, um, uh, the, the space where the students collect a lot of their, their resources. Um, some of them including uh, avatars, right? So we had to create age appropriate avatars, both human and non-human, and allow local accounts that are locked onto the grid. Um, we created the usual socializing spaces and spaces for play, and also creating an environment where there's a lot of, a, a lot of reward for, um, um, uh, for, for exploration which is always critical, and the, the sort of classic um, orientation pathways and sandboxes. So all of the things that most people here know intuitively is important in building a community. Those are the types of environments that, um, that, uh, that we set up in this space. But really, this, this thing I really wanted to stress is the, the hypergrid-enabled content enriching the build. There's an incredible amount of, of quality content that's needed to build out any environment like this. And my focus is really on level design and user experience, maybe tweaking some highly customized content. But there's a huge need for things like quality models of buildings and trees and avatars and furniture and so forth. So I spent a lot of time um, 
looking across the hypergrid and both free content and content for sale in places like Kitely Marketplace. And by the end of it, um, I had a list of over 60 people because I wanted to keep track of who were all the content creators who were providing content that could be used in this project. So moving forward, I'm going to make sure that all those folks are always recognized in any presentations or, or anything like this. Um, and here's a list of all of them here. And if you go to that link, there's actually a backup copy that I have running on an Outworld's uh, Dreamworld build running on my desktop if you want to poke around and see what it looks like. Um, and lastly, I wanted to mention that the uh, we'll put the slides up after the presentation is over, and there's the, the, the URL for it. And that's it. I wanted to hand it back to you, Karina, so you can talk more about the cool details. <laughs> Great. Thanks, John. Um, so um, that was actually quite a nice little chance for me to have a go at trying to uh, tweet the conference presentation whilst presenting, which is an interesting experience. Um, hopefully some of you will see that soon. Um, so just to give you a little background to the Slurtles, which you'll see a couple of them just floating to my right um, by the, the Avcom presenter podium. Um, Slurtles are designed to be what we'd call low floor, so they're very easy to use, wide wall, um, so that um, we can create a really wide range of things um, with them and also so they've got a high ceiling so we can um, make something very simple so we can engage with them very easily and quickly but they also allow us to create quite complex things and engage in conceptually um, complex complex ideas <clears throat> and really what I've done is I've, I've borrowed, stolen some um, existing um, and wonderful ideas, um, things like Lego bricks, the idea that you can just uh, take these very simple little bricks um, click them together and we can make something really quite complicated with them, um, really just limited by imagination. We've got turtle graphics, which some of you will be familiar with, a um, little line drawing program whereby you program the turtle and it draws a line as it moves. We've got Lego Mindstorms just below that then, um, which is a, a robot in the physical world. Um, and then on the right hand side, we've got Scratch, which some of you will be familiar with, which is a graphical programming environment. And basically I'm taking all these ideas together and putting them into Slurtles. So I'm going to ask my glamorous assistant, John, to kindly uh, give us a quick demonstration of the Slurtles in action. All right, here we go, <laughs> operating live without a net here. Um, let's see here. So if you look at the, 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 the turtle, the slurtle that's sitting on the ground near the podium, um, let me turn his scripts on here. And uh, let's see here. Oh, come on. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, if you click on him, you'll, you'll see he goes, woo, I'm drawing a rainbow. There you go. <laughs> And that's just a basic, you know, basic uh, series of, of commands you can use. But, but one of the cool things is, oh, and if any if anybody clicks on it, yes, it'll just obey your command. So it's going to now just keep drawing a rainbow into the sky forever. That's awesome. Um, and then the other one here that's floating above the uh, above above the. Uh, let me see here. Turn the scripts to running. Okay. The one that's above the ground here. When I click on him, he draws a star. See, and, and that's, it's really interesting, you know, kids look at a star, it's like, how do I draw a star? And they realize, okay, there are angles, and one is 108 degrees, and one is 36 degrees, and how can I, from the turtle's perspective, draw that? And um, so it's a, it's a very fun, very tangible way to, um, to visualize uh, mathematics and to visualize the concept of, you know, if this, then that, which is how you program uh, robots. Great. Thanks, John. And um, off the turtle goes again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, it, it, the way it's programmed is just using, well, I've got a picture of Scratch for Second Life, but we've got a Scratch for OpenSim as well. Um, and we just click and drag our blocks from the left-hand side and build up our script on the right-hand side. And um, so John's using a when I am touched. So um, every time you touch it, the turtle goes around again. Um, and you just press the copy Linden script button. And that gives us our text style language just to be able to put in our turtle. And the turtle's just, every time it moves, it draws a line by using the pen down command. So really very nice and simple for the learners to use. Um, yeah, we, we, they can engage in 3D graphics or, or thinking about 3D mathematical concepts, which is fantastic. I'm being told to wrap up, so I'm going to just steal one extra minute from question time. Um, just to show you just a picture of, of the stairs there. Um, 
and a, an example script. So you can see that's quite simple, but if we had to write that in a text-based language right from the very beginning when we haven't done any programming before, it's going to be quite complicated. And um, these are some of the things that our learners have created using Slurtles. Um, so we've got an interactive piano, one group decided to make an obstacle course, another group made an enchanted forest, which was all kind of cool. And just to finish up, I just wanted to mention to you a couple of next steps. So I'm piloting this with a couple of schools, one in the UK and one in Ireland. And I'm co-creating lessons with the teachers for um, to introduce students to computer programming, 11 to 12 year olds. And to um, actually, they will be using programming, of course, but um, actually to learn different mathematical concepts. Um, so instead of about learning maths, the students use the turtles to become mathematicians. So they explore and work out the mathematical concepts themselves. And that's with 12 to 13 year olds in Ireland. And from that, so we're going to get feedback from the students and the teachers, uh, refine the island, design a little bit, um, and be looking to recruit new schools. And I've actually already got one in Greece that's uh, really keen to get involved. And obviously we're talking about primary, uh, yes, middle school and um, secondary school. So um, if anybody would like more information, um, I do have a journal article, which I think John's put up for me in the um, Expo Centre. Um, and otherwise, feel free to drop me a line. So thank you very much, everyone. All right, Karina and John, thank you very much. These turtles are so much fun. And Karina, I can't, I think the programming that you've come up with for these kids are, are gonna, is going to be wonderful for all of them. Um, I want to remind the audience that you can see what's coming up on the conference schedule at conference.opensimulator.org. Coming up uh, in a little bit here at 7.30 a.m. PST, our session entitled Remote Controlling Open Simulator. Um, so we will see you all uh, in a little bit here as we change our speakers out. Um, and if you have a little bit of time, you can go over to OSCC 16 um, Expo 3 region or Expo 2 region and check out all of our um, booths there. Thank you.